So, last week we discussed Node.js, which is, of course, a, a program that allows you to run JavaScript. Now, from what I understand, there's been a lot of confusion about why we need Node. Um, originally, we started writing JavaScript that was executed by the browser, right? And if you recall, we would simply put script tags inside of our HTML. The browser would then pick that up and run the JavaScript that was either between the two tags or that was referenced using the source or SRC attribute. Um, did anyone understand what I just said? <laughs> did, did anyone not understand what I just said? Really? OK. All right. Um, OK, maybe we'll cover that briefly. Um, but then the question was, well, then why do we need Node? If we can already execute JavaScript in the browser, what's the point of having this other thing that executes JavaScript again? Well, so the answer to this is simple. So first of all, imagine you were to download some JavaScript from the server. Let's say you go to Facebook.com and they send you some JavaScript. Your browser then draws the HTML, notices the script tag, executes the code. Suppose that code had logic in it to read files on your file system, to delete files on your file system, to create new files on your file system. Is this a good idea? No. Why? Why is it not OK for other servers to just send you code that then deletes files on your system? Exactly, right? You don't want other random web applications, some person who happens to write some JavaScript, you accidentally go to their site, they get their code on your, on your browser, and suddenly they're reading your files, they're deleting your files, right? This is not a good idea, right? That would be a security breach, yes? So it so happens that in the browser, uh, there are rules. In fact, the browser doesn't give you any mechanism by which you can write to the rest of your disk. I mean, there's the, in HTML5, there are some standards where you can write to a specific area that's just your own, but you can't just read any part of the file system or modify any part of the file system, right? But at the same time, consider this. Imagine you're writing a server and the server wants to send you images. Consider Facebook, right? Well, with Facebook, you send requests to, for example, download people's uh, images, right? So you can view them on the screen. Well, that's a request to get a file. An image is a file, yes? OK, so that means Facebook, the server on Facebook, has to be able to read from the file system that file and then send it to you. Yes? Does that make sense? OK, so that means the code that runs on the server needs access to the file system. The code that runs in the browser does not have any access to the file system. This is just one example of many things that differ between the environment that runs on the server and the environment that runs on the client. And so for this reason and many others that we'll cover moving forward, we want to be able to write JavaScript that's executed by this other thing we call it node, that we use to write server code. And then we have other code that runs on the client that runs on the client code. <laughs> um, is that clear? Does that kind of clear things up as far as why we need node versus? Yes, good, OK. So now let's, let me show you an example of how you can write a server that actually serves files. That is to say, it gets requests, and then be based on the request, not only does it send text back, which we saw last week, but you can actually send files back, images, movies, things of this nature. So let's have a look at this code here. So if you will recall, the first line of code requires a library or pulls in a library called FS, which stands for file system, right? FS allows you access to the file system. So you can read files, write files, etc. Next, we have the path module, which allows us to work with paths. And then we have the HTTP module, which will allow us to make an HTTP server. However, how many people here know what a file path is? Raise your hands. I figured as much. So what I've done is I've prepared a separate talk about file systems. So let's talk about this now. So what is a file system? 
Well, a file system is just a way that your operating system uses, the operating system being the program that kind of runs and manages your computer, Windows, iOS, right? These are all operating systems. A file system is a mechanism by which it organizes files on your computer. Okay? That's it. And the way it does this is instead of putting all of your files in this one big list, instead it groups them, it categorizes them. Each one of these groups of files is called a directory. Sometimes in Windows they refer to this as a folder. It's just a group of other things. And directories can have other directories or files inside of them. Here's an example of a very simple sort of directory hierarchy, right? So at the root or at the starting point, at the very top, we have our C drive, typically in Windows. In other systems such as Linux, we have root, which is just like a slash, right? So then within that, we can have other things. In this case, we have folders or directories. So we have windows, users, programs. And each of those, in turn, can have other things inside, right? Now, a path is nothing more than um, a string that specifies how to get somewhere in your file system. It's a location, right? And the location is typically done in this way. So you start off with root, which is your C. You then go to the next thing and the next thing until you arrive at your destination. So, suppose we wanted a path to license.txt. This is a file. If we go starting from the root, how do we get there? What is the path to get there? To say. Right. So we start off with C, right? We then go into, hang on, program files. We then go to git, and then we go to license.txt, right? So that is an example of a path, right? It's a series of steps you have to go through to arrive at your destination. Very good. So that's what a file path is. We then have a notion of a relative path. Now, if you noticed the example that I just gave, the path we did was relative to, in other words, was starting from, the very top, starting from C, right? Well, a relative path is one that begins from somewhere else, where the, the starting point for the path is not C, it's not the root, it's somewhere else. Let me give you an example. Suppose we wanted to start from programs and wanted to get to license.txt. What would be the path then? Exactly, so from here you go to git, from there you go to license, done. So relative to programs, that is to say starting from programs, to get to license.txt, the path is git license.txt. Okay? So that is what I mean by a relative path. It's starting from somewhere other than the root. Files, by the way, that begin from the root are often known as absolute paths. So you have absolute paths, one that begin with the root, and relative paths that begin from some other directory. Questions so far? Yes? So if there is a related path, why do we need this one? Why do we need absolute paths? Um, because it depends on context. That is to say, it depends on from the location where, you're call, where, where you need that path from. Um, you may not know. You, if I just gave you a relative path, and just you ended up somewhere randomly in the directory hierarchy or the file system, it wouldn't help you. It would only help you if you knew the starting point, right? So if you know the starting point, you're right. Relative is all you need. But if you don't, absolute will give you one value that will always get you to where you want to go. Does that make sense? OK. So that's what we mean by that. Now, here's the, do you remember that when we were t talking about command line arguments in that terminal, we said dot dot is what you use to go back. If you do cd dot dot, change directory dot dot, it puts you back up one directory. Do you recall that? Well, it so happens that you can actually use the dot dot notation when specifying your paths. So for example, suppose we're doing a relative path starting from git, and we want to get to notepad. The path for that would be you go up one, right? So you go to programs, you go up one again to local disk, then you go down to Windows, then you go down to Notepad, right? You guys see that? 
If you're starting from Git, you have to go up to Programs, you have to go up to Local C, then down to Windows, then down to Notepad EXE, right? Okay, so going up is dot dot. Let me show, the, show you that in practice. So these are pictures of really cute puppies. Ah, I know. Okay, so in the first example, I have what's known as an absolute path. An absolute path typically starts with a forward slash, okay? So an absolute path means from my file server, which we'll talk about later, the very starting point where my file server is starting, from there go into CS110, then go into the image directory, and then in the image directory then pull out puppy.jpg, okay? In this example though, it, hap it so happens that this file is actually running deeper and you have to go back up one, then up one again, then down to image, then down to JPG, puppy JPG. Let me show you the structure so this makes a bit more sense to you. So we go to, where is it? CS110, here we go. So in here, so this public is my starting point for my server. All files that get served out from my server get served out relative to public. In here, you can see I have CS110, and inside of that, I have image. So if we go back here, you can see that I say, starting from my starting point, go to CS110, then go to image, then get puppy JPG. And when it does this, it downloads the image and renders the first puppy. Is that part clear? Okay. Now, but this file, this file system.html, happens to live in, hang on, lectures, extras, file system here. So in, this is my starting point, extras. From here, to get to puppy, I have to go up one, then I have to go up one again, then from here I go down into image, and then I get the puppy, which is somewhere in here. Which is why you get back, back, image, puppy. Confused yet? No? Oh, this is great. Okay, are you guys kind of getting this? You get how this works? Oh, why do we need the second one? Okay, why don't we always use absolute paths? Why do we need relative paths? Would be your question. Okay, so this is a very good question. So why do we need, does anyone have an answer? I'm curious. Do you know why it may, yes? Yeah, so okay, so one example might be that an absolute path is just longer. Potentially, right? Potentially much longer than a relative path. So that's one reason, yes? Yeah, for example, we have absolute paths and we move our folder to another location. Yes. That's, 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 the, that's the answer, right? That is the best answer. So uh, let me repeat that. So the answer is this. Um, when you do things relative to each other, if you move a directory or you move a folder around, things still stay, can still stay relative to each other. So, so things continue to work. If you do everything based on the very beginning, if you move anything around, you can break that long path. Think of it this way. The longer path you have, the harder it is to keep that promise, right? The, harder, the easier it is to break it. So the smaller it is, the less the probability that you will break your path. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes? Sure, but then don't call it absolute path. You can just call it a, a relative path. What you just said is nothing more than a relative yeah, path. Yeah, you have uh, some public some folder. Good question. Yeah, yeah. So it's not, yes, understood. So his question is this. Well, how come you're, it says, I said that the top one is an absolute path, right? And yet it doesn't begin from root. I'm on, I'm on the Mac OS, right? It doesn't begin from my very beginning with user, our mesh, and whatever. Instead, it's just this. Well. In my server, in the context of my server, it's an absolute path. In the context of my entire file system, that is to say my entire computer, it is absolutely a relative path. Yeah. So it's really two ways of looking at the same coin. Yeah. But it's a path. Think of it that way. Yeah. Um, other questions? Why don't you write public before CS? So public is the folder from which I start with whenever I do all my work. You'll, you'll see why in a moment, but that's sort of my base. 
Um, so there's no need. Everything is inside. I'm already inside of that. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, other questions? This is okay? So we kind of understand file systems now. Okay. Yes? A certain location, yeah. So, yeah. So at first, we said to go send the CSS image puppy. Yeah, so that first slash is like go to the beginning, go to the root, whatever the root is relative to the environment we're in. And we're saying go to CS110, image puppy JPG. Yes. But then in the next one, we go back, back, image puppy. And it's still yeah, because we're not starting with the, so in the next one, we're not starting with the root. We're starting with wherever this file, this HTML file happens to live. And this HTML file happens to live pretty deep inside. So we have to walk back up and then go in. Make sense? Um, other questions? So by the way, if, if, you're, if you're slightly confused as to exactly where these paths should sort of start and end, it's OK. It's one of those things where you just need to work through. And as you do more of this stuff, you'll, get, you'll understand how things work relative to each other. I just want you to understand the concept behind it. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Understood. So it's starting with wherever this HTML file is. So this HTML file, this exact like file system.html, the actual file itself, the HTML, it lives somewhere where if you from there were to go up and up, you would end up right in CS110 from which you can go to image and then get puppy.jpg. Yeah, sure. Let me zoom, let me zoom in one second. Yeah. Moment. Okay, so this, this file system is where we're starting from, right? So from here, I have to go up to lectures up to CS110, and then from there down into image, and then from there down into wherever puppy is. It's somewhere in here. It's one of these pictures. Yes? No, no, no. This here, hang on. Wait, wait. Watch. This here is lectures extras file system.html this whole file is file system.html yes you with me okay file system html is right there which is inside of extras yes so we go up to lectures up to cs110 down to image down to whatever got it other questions or concerns so far Exactly. Every dot dot is one up. So if you do two, it's two. Yeah? You just keep going up, up, and then down. Remember that a file system is a tree. So you all, everything has one parent. Right? So dot dot always implies go to your parent. Yeah? Uh, good. Other questions or concerns? Done? We're good. OK. Well, now that you understand paths, let's do something really interesting. Hang on. There we go. Let's now have a look at this. Look at it for a while. Try to figure out what it does. Don't tell me. Just try to figure out what it does. What do you think it does? Just let it sink in. Oh, let me zoom this way. Wait, wait, wait. OK. Perfect. Now all the code is visible from top down. OK, raise your hands if you kind of understood what it does. OK, not bad. Um, what does it do? Wait, 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 wait. What does it do? Yeah. 
Ага. Okay. All right. So you mentioned a window. Um, so first question is, where do you get the window? What window? Okay. So separate from this, you're saying there could be a browser separate from this that could make a request to this. Okay. Good. That request, once it's received, would then call this function with that request information inside of this variable here. People in the back, can you read the code? Yes? Okay. So the request would contain the information that's sent by the browser or whoever's making the request. And then the response object would have all the mechanism by which I can then send information back. Yes? That's clear. Okay. Well, once we have the request and the response, we then do some magic, and it's not really important at this point what, but we create some sort of a path from which we read the information. Read file means read the information inside of the file. Makes sense? So we read the information that's inside of that path. We then get back either an error or some data. The data being the information that was inside of the file. Clear so far? Okay. If there was an error, we're going to return or we're going to send as a response to that request the fact that, oh, the file was not found. Right? So this is the error code, which again, you don't have to memorize error codes. It's just some number that says, oop, here's the status. There was an error, everything was good, whatever. 200 is typically when you say everything is okay. Not found is just a header message. And then this is what actually will get printed on the browser. Right? This is the actual text, the payload that will come in. And then the browser will put that on the screen and you'll see 404 file not found. That's if there was an error. What if there was not an error? What do you think this does here? Yeah, it sends that data, the data that you just read from the file, to the client. Along with a status code 200 to say everything was good. Yes. What is? Ah, OK. So we could have actually done this by just taking this and just put it right in there, and we would have been done. Write allows you to uh, keep writing until you're finished. In other words, suppose you're constructing a message, a message you want to send to the client. If you don't have the entire thing right away, you can write some, write some, write some, then end, and that's when the packet will get sent to the client. With end, whatever data you, you put there, it sends it and it's done. So end means I'm done writing. Go. Does that make sense? Okay. If we write something, we uh, return rest that end and something in the if statement. In this if statement, if you were to do what? Oh, rest write, and then we were to do another write? It would stick this with that. It would write together. Yeah, one end in next. Yeah. Other, yes, sir. Yeah, okay, so now let's, okay, now that we understand sort of at a high level what this does, let's consider what a static base path is. Well, so dot is the one thing we haven't talked about yet. So dot means start from where I am right now in the directory hierarchy, in the file system. So dot means start here. So dot means start from, start from right here. So from where you are, we're going to go into the public directory. That is this. Then what we're going to do is from the request, we're going to take the URL that's sent to us and concatenate it or stick it to our original directory. So what we'll get is dot slash public slash whatever the user sent us. Watch how it works. It will make more sense to you in a moment. You want me to call it Hopage? Will that be easier? It doesn't, the name doesn't matter. The point is, I, I'll, t I'll tell you why in a moment. I'll tell you why in a moment. Wait. You know what? Let me simp, Jesus Christ. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me. 
Let me simplify this code a bit more. Um, let me get rid of that. Let me get rid of that. And let me just, in this request, do rec.url. Let me start the server. So for that, I go to terminal. OK, so I just wrote node and then the name of this file in order to execute it, right? OK, so now we have a running server. What port is this server running on? 3001. Good. So now let's open the browser and go to localhost 3001. Bless you. File not found. I wonder why. Well, why don't we see the request URL that's being sent to us? Why don't I console.log the request.url? Restart my server. And let's do this again. It printed a single forward slash. Hang on, let me zoom in. It printed a single forward slash. Right? Why? Because I didn't say anything here. There's no path. So let me specify a path like foo slash bar. File not found. Now it printed foo bar. Now let me open up my directory, uh, file, my file system browser here. And so we're starting from public. No, wait, we're starting from here. We want to go into public, and then we want to go into puppy.jpg, right? So from starting point, we want to go to public, then puppy.jpg. So let's do that. So let's go to public, then go to puppy.jpg. Oops. No luck. Let's see what the terminal found. Public puppy.jpg. Now I could try something like this. Still not working. Now the reason for this, I think, hang on. It's reading a file from the current directory. Hang on. One second, one second. Let's read. Node. Ah, uh, screw it. I tried to do something clever and could not. Watch this. Let's go back. <laughs> OK, so you see this dot? This is kind of important. And I can't pass a dot, or I couldn't pass a dot as a parameter. So dot means I have to start from where I am. Uh, oh, I know what we could do. Sorry, wait, 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 I know. Watch this. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, I found the solution. Let's do dot slash plus request URL. Is that right? Or dot? Hang on. Wait for it. Yes. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're too kind, you're too kind. All right, so there's my cute little puppy. OK, so notice that the address I went to was public puppy.jpg, yes? OK, so that public.jpg is the request that I got here. And I just concaten a dot to say that path is relative to where I am. So relative to where I am is the starting point of my project. That's node.js.examples. I went to public, and I got puppy.jpg. Question, how do I access yay.html? <laughs> Yay, that's, that's yay.html, by the way. How do I access form.html? There it is, et cetera, et cetera. So again, what's happening is the URL that's coming in, I'm trying to look for that path relative to where I am. And I'm going in here, I'm going in here, and I'm pulling out yay, puppy, and hello.html. Does that make sense? Sort of? So what this does then, what does the server do? 
Can someone actually explain to me what it does? Yeah. So how many people here know HTML and possibly CSS? OK. So you make a file, an HTML file, with CSS. You put a bunch of really cool things on it. You spin up the server. And then you put that file somewhere in your file system inside the project. And then when people go to your, your website, slash whatever, it then reads that file and sends it back, and the person sees it on their screen. And that's how web pages are made. Yay. OK, any, yes, sir? Uh, I want to know, you can't only open like text files and photo for like GPG or oh. In the browser. OK, you're the, you're the author of the browser, right? You tell me. You know how to make a request. In the response, you know what file you have, right? The header information tells you this is a text file or this is whatever. What would you do? For some files, maybe you would have the code to draw it. And some files, maybe you wouldn't, right? OK, one thing you could do with files you don't know how to open, like a zip file, is Yeah, or just download it. Just say that you're downloading it and just say it's here, open it if you want to. Can it access an external command like if it's a zip, find if the computer has a zip? Does the browser, you mean, have access to that? Uh, so I don't, think the, I don't think you have access to the full registry because that would be a security issue. The operating system doesn't let you see all the registries. Uh, but what you can do is just say, hey, open the application with this. And then the operating system decides what to open it with. Uh, you can give it a hint. You can say, if Word exists, open with Word. Right? So you can say, open this Word. Uh, and if it exists, great. If it doesn't, I think there's kind of there's like an error or something that comes back. Don't worry about any of that. Uh, other questions? Yes? Yes. Uh, let me try to remember the example you referred. Mm. So when you ah, Haskell, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, Haskatsa, Haskatsa. Yes. Okay. So the problem is, is that the the problem is, is that the URLs are coming in with a slash in front of it. I could remove the slash. If I did, it would be relative to where the file was getting served from. The moment you put slash, just slash, it's absolute. It means start from the very beginning and then go. Dot slash means start from where I am now, where the application, the server is relative to that, and then go from there. Right? So there are kind of three different cases. If you're a little bit confused with the cases, don't worry. It's one of these things where once you start using it, it becomes super simple. Um, I just want you to understand in theory that there's this text, this string, a path, that will tell you the location of a file. That's pretty much all you need to know. The rest you'll figure out as you do your homework assignments. Cool? Other questions? OK, so now let's put things together. So we have a server that allows us to serve files. Why don't we request a file from that server from here? So why don't we, hang on, let's zoom in. From here, let's go to localhost, right? Localhost 3001 slash, was it, uh, what was the path again? Uh, public, sorry, one second. Public. You know, but public form.html. Hmm. Wait, let's see what the server is getting. One second. The server is not getting anything. Why is it not getting anything? Lo lo wait. Local host. Oh, I know. Boom. OK. So look, what I've done here is I've just made the request to localhost 3001 public puppy, JPG. And that loaded that puppy and then put it inside of my image tag, and here's the puppy. Let's have a look at 
um, the network tab. So you remember this tab? Hang on. This network tab here? So that tells you the requests that went out. So let me clear it and let me change something here just to refresh. Okay, so look what happens. So I happen to be using some CSS from, wait, 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 let me zoom in, hang on. Okay. So I've pulled in three different things here. I've pulled in a CSS file, a, a JavaScript file, and puppy.jpg. Let's focus on this. Puppy.jpg, I went to this request, I did an HTTP get, I got a 200 back saying everything is okay, and it looks like that. Aw, that's what I got back. And then when I got it back, I rendered it, or the browser should say, rendered it inside of the image tag. And that's what I, what I saw here. Is it coming together? Okay, let's review one more time, just because I understand that sometimes these things are difficult to follow. We have the internet, let's go way back. We have the internet, which is nothing more than a bunch of computers kind of connected together, right? They're connected using wires, using radio, whatever. The internet then has rules by which every one of these computers has to follow for it to function. These are known as protocols. We have the internet protocol, also known as IP. The internet protocol is simply a mechanism by which given an address or an internet protocol address or IP address, if you send it to a computer near you, it will then come send a computer that's near it and so on and it will keep bouncing around until finally it reaches the destination. That is to say the destination that matches the address you're trying to send. So the internet protocol is nothing more than a bunch of rules that allows your message to reach its destination. On top of that, we have a protocol called TCP. TCP is a mechanism by which we can be sure that when you send a package, the person you sent it to actually got the package. How does that happen? How do I know they got it? Exactly. They send back an acknowledgement saying, I got it, everything is good, and I know that, now I can send more. Exactly. Then on top of that, what is it? Is it like what? In mail. It's not really like in mail because when you send me mail, or did you mean email or regular mail? Email. Oh yeah, email uses TCP, yeah. Because I want to make sure you got the email, right? If I send it to you, it can't be, eh, eh. If a wire got cut, that's, that's a problem, right? I have to make sure you got the email. Okay. Then on top of that, we typically have HTTP, at least in web applications, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is a protocol that sits on top of TCP and has various methods like get, post, etc. Post is used to send data, get is used to retrieve data. When you open up your browser and you type in facebook.com, is that an address? No, it's just a name, right? So we first have to resolve the address. We go to DNS, a domain name system. It's just another computer that knows, given this name, it will give me that address, right? Okay, so I go, I go through this DNS resolution where I resolve or I understand what the address should be. I then now can send information to Facebook because I have their address. So the first thing that happens when you type in facebook.com is an HTTP GET goes out to that address. Do we know the port number when we go to Facebook? Do you type 80 in your address? No. So technically we don't know, right? We simply send an HTTP GET to that address. When Facebook server receives the request, it notices, oh, there's no port number. It's an HTTP request they probably want to go to 80, which is where our HTTP server is sitting. When you go to Facebook.com, do you then follow it with slash something something, or do you just go to Facebook.com? Right? So that means Facebook.com, when it first receives a, a, something, its URL for the request is empty. So it sends a default, an else, if you will, right? So if nothing is specified, it sends something. And that something happens to be the actual HTML page that renders on your screen. That's your starting point, right? Then that HTML page has images inside, image tags. The image tags have source references to actual files. 
Additional requests are made to the server saying, give me this image. And that image is sent back. Exactly the way we saw here, where an image tag has a reference, we go and download the image and put it on your screen. And that's how you see the pictures of your friends on Facebook. With me? Now, connect what I just said with the code we just wrote. We implemented an HTTP server that knows how to serve out files. That means we can serve images, we can serve uh, movies, we can serve HTML files, we can serve any kind of a file out to a client, assuming it makes a request to a file that we have. You guys see how this is starting to make sense? Yes or no? Okay, so who, who is still like lost and doesn't get anything that's happening? Okay, no, no brave souls in our crowd. Oh, what, one person, really, is lost? Okay, which part? Is there just overall just confused or overall confused? Yes, or just one part? Fair, no that's, no, that's a fair point. All right, look, there are those of you, I'm sure, who are just so lost at this point that it's difficult to ask a question because you don't have context in which to ask the question. And I completely understand that. My suggestion to you is absolutely go to office hours. Um, if you can't make it to mine, that's okay. We have great teaching assistants, go to theirs. Um, if you're still lost and still struggling and you feel like you're just not moving forward, write me. Okay, and we'll figure something out. Okay, well, I, I don't want you. I don't want anyone here to fail. Right, I will push you forward no matter what. I'll make time if I have to. Right. Um, other questions? No questions. Keep going. Okay. Ah, so good question. So notice how I, I started off by writing HTTP colon slash slash. Does anyone know why I did that? Why do I write HTTP colon? It's the protocol, yeah. Uh, so the browser, when it reads that address, needs to know how to construct a message to send. What rule does it have to use to send the message? Typically, the rule implies the header information, right? Um, and so by this, I'm saying use the HTTP protocol because my server only understands HTTP. If, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> if you send a message to my server with any other protocol, the server will not know how to respond to you. It's like me speaking, what's a language you don't know? A language you don't know, you, Chinese, fine. If I speak Chinese to you, you won't know how to respond. So we have to agree on a rule that we're both going to speak Armenian, English, whatever, right? Same idea. Yes, sir. It's not a path. It's just a standard for how you define the, the, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. For example, there's the file system protocol. So if you want to just read something from your file system, you can do, I think, file colon slash 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 blah, blah, blah. And then the path, like C blah, you know. But again, that's, there's access control stuff on there. Like a, a random web application can't just read things off of your disk. Yeah, there are lots of, there's, FT, uh, there's FTP protocol, file transfer protocol. There's F HTTPS, which is the secure encrypted version of HTTP. Is that enough? Okay. S, secure, S for secure. Uh, other questions? Yes. Yes. Okay, so we technically didn't do it, right? The browser did it on our behalf. What we did, guys, guys, pay attention. So often when I say the client, uh, I'm blurring the line between the code that programmers write, like we, that we write, and the stuff that the browser does on our behalf underneath that we don't see. We as programmers simply write HTML in which we specify the source should come from here. The browser then underneath, without us seeing it, when it reads the HTML and tries to draw it, will say, I have to draw an image, because there's an image tag, but what image? It then reads the source, 
it says, I have to now get this source, right? I have to get the image. So it constructs an HTTP GET request to that address. When it receives the response, it then reads the response and draws it on the screen. Got it? So the response will be the link, like no, the response will be the actual file, the data, the binary data. Uh, the request that's sent to the server will be um, the path. How do we need? Uh, I'm sorry. Wh who knows? The server or, or the client? Who who am I? I'm the client. No, you don't have to copy the. Okay, so today we're going to be doing lots of node work, so we're, where we're going to be uh, sending things to the server and getting things back. Which, if you understand that, homework is going to be a piece of cake. So that's what I'm about to start. So should I keep going? Yes, yes. Everyone's like, oh, God, yeah. Go. OK. All right. OK. OK. So thus far, so up until this point, um, the only information that we were sending to our server as far as the request goes has been like the URL, right? Which has been typically like slash whatever, like slash public slash puppy, right? JPG, um, that kind of thing. It turns out we can also pass parameters. So parameters are key value pairs. And by key value, I simply mean name and value. Name, value, name, value. The way to do this is by you first specify question, and then you specify the name equals some value. And then if you want additional values, you do ampersand, which is that, this thing. Let me show you in practice. So in here, hang on. OK, let's give this as an example. So let me zoom in. OK, so if I were to do like slash, I don't know, hang on slash foo slash bar slash zoo. This is like the path information that gets sent to the server, right? It turns out I can also do parameters like name Joe and age 13 and I don't know, whatever, page five. And each of these name, value, name, value, name, value is information that the server can then use to construct a response. When do you think such a, such a thing might be useful? Can anyone think of it? Yes. Search. Boom, exactly. Wow. Yes, search. So right off the bat, suppose I wanted to implement some sort of a search functionality on the server. I might say slash search, so it knows that the route that should go to is search, but search what? Well, the parameter might tell me. I might say something like, have the search text be Joe. Or no, let's, let's be more patriotic. Or, yeah. OK, so this is saying go to the route, you know, foo bar zoo, and the parameter is search text Armenia. So if, you know, the, the route public foo bar and zoo happen to be search, I would, what this means is search for Armenia. I might say the sorting order. So I might say, and sort uh, alphabetically, and direction, oh, you can't see that, hang on. <laughs> direction ascending. Right? So you can just pass in hints, parameters, that the server can then use to make a decision. Yes? Are you written alphabetically, right? Alphabet, oh, whatever, yeah. Huh? I, yes, I, I realize I mistyped. Other questions? OK, so now let's actually go through an example. What is this? Um, all right. <laughs> OK, 
Okay. So uh, let's have a look at this example here. Let's keep it very simple. Let's simply write back, risk.send, the, the request URL. What does this server do? Yeah, basically the information that I'm sending it in the URL, in the address bar, it's just sending it back to me as text. Let's run it. Node, was this 14.js? Okay. So here, if we go to localhost 3001, risk.send is, oh, oops, whoops, 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 whoops. Did I say send? I meant end. Sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay. So here, if I type in some sort of, you know, foo slash bar slash zoo, it's going to send it back to me. Yes? I hope that's pretty straightforward, right? I'm just sending back the, the URL that was sent to me. Clear? Yes? OK. Now let me add parameters like question, I don't know, name is Ruben. It's now sending me back exactly this text here. If I do and, uh, age is not going to tell you. It gives back that. Yeah, you're yeah, eating. Yeah. We wrote something that it returns the same thing in the Node.js. Why is it now returns it in here? OK. What wh is request URL? It's just text, right? Yeah. Yes? OK. So I'm simply sending back text, which is the URL that was sent to me. If you're asking why I'm doing this, just to show you that I can. So far, there's no practical use for this. But do you, do you understand what's happening? Yes? OK. We can write any text we want. We can say. It's just, it just takes the string that was passed to it, this entire thing, and gives it back to me as one text. Request URL is this. This is the request URL. Yes? It's just text. That whole thing is, yeah? Is that clear? Yes? From delete what? Oh, just the path? Yeah. Hi, Danasa. Savjin Gem slash Gagahit. What the bunchka? It's the, the path URL is a path, right? The path, if there's nothing in it, implies nothing. Just slash. That's just how it is. The default is slash. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes? So you noticed again, if I do whatever, whatever arguments, A is is one and B is two. I simply get back this entire thing as a text. Is, does that make sense? Okay, it's important that that makes sense because if that does, URL is that text, right? If I want to, for example, create an add function, I want to give my server two numbers, have it add them together and give me back the response. Okay, this is what we're going to try to do. So for that, I'm going to give it parameters, right? So I need to give it like what the left value is of the plus and the right value is of the plus. It's going to read the left value, read the right value, and add them together, and then return back the response. Does everyone understand what we're trying to do? OK. But again, remember that request URL is just a string. It's one long string. I have to extract from that string the parts that I want. I just have the string. I have to take this out. I have to take this out. And I have to take potentially this out. And I have to take it separately so that I get separate two, a separate one, and a separate whatever. Specifically, the path we're going to use is add, where we're going to give it a left parameter of, let's say, four, and 
a right parameter of whatever, 9. OK. It, right now, it just gives me back that text, right? So first thing I want to do is extract this, then extract this, then extract this. Now taking, yes. Now taking these things out of text is actually not that simple. Uh, we can use regular expressions for those of you who know what that is, but you, most of you do not. So instead what we can do is leverage other people's code. That is to say code written by others to help us do this. So how? Well, let's have a look. So we have this URL package that we can pull in. And it knows how to parse URLs, URL being that text. When it parses it, it returns to us whatever that is. Let's see what that is. Console.log parsed URL. Restart, come here. Look, look what it returned. Hang on. Ah, there. So it returned this object, this URL object that contains within it all this information. It says that it knows that the path is this, um, that it has a search crit or query criteria of that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it kind of broke our string down into parts. Does that make sense? So now if we want to know what the path is, we can simply do whatever that object is, dot path name, and it will give us slash add. So in here you'll notice I do parsed URL dot path name is add, then we're gonna do the add, else we're gonna do other things. Okay, but what about these arguments? Hang on. What about this part? This is still text, right? What I want to do is specifically take out four and specifically take out nine so I can add them together, right? Does that make sense? Okay. Well, to do that, I can use another package, another library called query string. If I call query string dot parse and I give it one of these texts, it will then give me back another object. Let's see what that object looks like. Hang on. Look what it gave me back. It gave me back an object that has a left value of 4 and a right value of 9. So what we've done here is we went from just text to an actual object that says these are the two values that are in this string. Did that progression make sense to you? Raise your hand if it did not. Okay. Let's go through this one more time, just very quickly. In fact, why don't we use a debugger? So uh, I'll, have, I'll post some, a tutorial about how to um, set up a debugger environment for you later. Uh, but for now, just I'm just going to do it. Um, so this was node 14. Moment. Let's put a debugger statement here, and then let's launch it. OK. So this is our debugger. Let me zoom in. That's too much. OK. So this is our, our application. This is our node system. As you can see, we load FS, path, HTTP, URL, and query string. And for each of these, uh, if I mouse over, hang on, if I mouse over FS, you can see all the various things that are attached to it, including, where's read file, hang on, read dir, read, read link, read whatever, what is this, uh, read file, there it is, this is the one we were using, and as you can see, it's a function that takes a path, potential arguments, and a callback, right, okay. So we read all this, then we're going to create our server, which will then return an HTTP object that we then call listen on, and it starts the server. Now, localhost 3001, yeah, I know. 
Okay, so now we broke. Let's have a look. Can everyone read my code or is it too small? It's too small? Crap, hang on. Ah, what did I just do? Can you read now? Okay, so request URL is that. It's that text there. Notice, request URL, mouse over it, there it is. Add left three. It's just a string, yes? From the string, I need to take out the three and the five so I can add them together. With me? So the first thing I'll do is I'll use this URL ob objects parse function in order to parse that string. Parsed URL is now an object that has all this stuff in it. Notice how while it broke up the path and the search or the query, it did not actually parse the query. It's still a string. So I still need to do more work in order to take out five and the three. So I use this other thing called query string dot parse, which then gives me the object that has left of three and right of five. Question, in this context, what is three? What kind of a value is three? It's a string. So if I were to do left plus right, what would I get back? 35 as a string, three five as a string, right? Okay, good, so we know this. So now, let's go back to our program and say, so assuming that the path name matches add, we're going to do parsed query dot left, which will give me the three as text. Then we pass that to a function called parse float. Parse float will parse or turn the text into a number. With me? So once we turn that text into left text into a number and right text into a number, we add them together to get the new number, the eight. But here's the problem. End can only take text. It cannot take numbers as, as input. You can only send back text. So how do you turn a number into text? What's a simple way you can do that? Put it into a quote. So, okay, so if I, the result of this, hang on. Const result is that. I now want to send back result. If I do this, result is a number, right? So how can I turn this into text? Watch this. What happens if I do this? Turns it into a string. This is the easiest way you can do it. Okay. What, what, if I what? There's also a notion of two string, but I don't want to get into it now. The simplest way is to simply concatenate with an empty string that then returns a string. So let's see if our new server works. Uh, I won't debug. I'll just do node. Hang on. Oh, I'm still doing this. Sorry. One sec, one sec, one sec. Eight. Hang on. Let me zoom in so you can see it in all its glory. Okay, let's add, I don't know, 13 to 55. Or, yeah. 68. You see? Okay. Now you must be asking yourselves, who cares? You just wrote a really bad calculator as a server. So what? The point is this, if you understand this idea that you can take parameters from the client, you can then do some computation on the server, in our case, adding numbers together, and then return back a response. Well, you can do lots of stuff. For example, uh, you guys use YouTube. Have you ever uploaded anything to YouTube? <laughs> Six times, that's awesome. So think about it. The way that works is you take some file which is just a bunch of bits, right, underneath the covers. And you send that to a server, to YouTube. YouTube then opens that up and then reads all the stuff inside and then does lots of different 
computation. It does compression. It changes the format. It does cleanup. It does all kinds of different things on your, on your file, turns it into a completely different format, and then that file is available for YouTube to see, which is why after you upload, there's this processing stage, if you guys remember. That's what that's doing. It's doing the computation. Think of Google. When you do a search in Google, right, the text that you type goes to Google as an argument. Google then goes to its servers and does all the complex computation of attempting to find the things that match your text, your search text. Then once it's compiled the result, it then sends the result back and that is drawn on your screen. Right? So this idea that you can send parameters to a server, have it do some processing and return the results, is really important and is actually the basis for much of what you use every single day. Okay, it's 2.45, which means we don't have a lot of time, but I did want to very quickly, rev by the way, this, sli this slide, this code, is available on, the, on my GitHub, right? It's where the project is. So if you want to read it more, understand it, just go to it, it's there. You can also see that it handles subtraction. Wait, there, it handles subtraction. <laughs> okay, um, let's talk about arrays briefly because I think there were some questions regarding arrays. But before we do, are there questions about this? No, okay. Again, remember, all this code is available for you. So go read it, play with it, change it, whatever you want. Um, so let's have a look at arrays. Uh, 3,000, is it 3,000? Hang on. Okay, okay. All right, can everyone see the code? Yeah, yeah, we'll do the obstacle of can in a second. Wait, wait. So let's make an array. Const a is an empty array. We can seed it with, with data, like one, two, three, four, five. Now we have an array with one, two, three, four, five in it. An array is just a list. Remember that. So I can ref reference or access any part of the array just by doing A and then pass the index of the value I want to get. So what will this give me? Exactly, it will give me this. I can put in anything I want. Now it will give me A. If I now print console.log B, what's it going to give me? Good. Wait, const. What am I missing here? A equals. A equals, thank you. Good, very good. Okay, how do I find the length of this array? A dot length. What's a way we can think about this length? It's just the last index plus one. Right? What, it, what index is this? Four. Plus one is five, that's the length. Simple. Let's write a for loop. That's not going to make. Let's write a for loop that prints these values. Uh, let i equals zero. I is less than a dot length. I plus plus. Oh right, that's what I meant. I knew that. <laughs> that that first one is this. Let me get rid of that. Okay, so here you see I'm, I'm iter iterating over all the values of the array and printing them one at a time. Why did I not put equals here? Because at zero we have this, one, two, three, four, five, we don't have anything, so it gives me undefined. Make sense? You understand how to build a for loop and iterate over values in an array? You have everything you need to do your homework assignments. Congratulations. Let's take a photo. Off talk of Karen! Hey! John, nasty shot. <laughs> <laughs>